In the previous video, we talked a little bit about um, doing different hypothesis tests, different statistical tests using the functions for those in R. In this set of slides, we're going to get a little bit into regression modeling. And then in the next, in this one, we'll talk about um, doing linear regression. And then in the next slide, we'll talk more broadly about the framework for generalized linear regression models. These generalized linear regression models serve as a really powerful framework for doing statistical analyses of your data. A lot of times you can use generalized linear models or GLMs to do um, a lot of the model fitting that you might want to do for, for the data set. It includes the ability to kind of like fit functions as a nonlinear, to have a nonlinear association with the outcome. And they also have room to expand to include not just linear regression, but also if you have different kinds of output, like binary of kind of a yes, no, or a zero, one, or count data for Poisson regression, or other types of regression models. So it's a really powerful framework. And a nice thing about R is that you're really using a very similar structure to fit all of these. So once you learn those structures, you can apply it quite widely across different things like um, linear regression and logistic regression and Poisson regression. So we'll look at it as an example at the World Cup data. Again, that is in the Faraway package. And then the name of it is World Cup. Let's also make sure that you load, if you want to run along, the tidyverse, broom, and ggfortify function. And we haven't used that ggfortify before, so if you don't have it installed yet, you might need to install that package. So as a reminder, this World Cup data, if you look at just the start of it, it's got data on different players with their team, position, time, shots, passes, tackles, and saves, and this is all for the 2010 World Cup. Now we just want to pick a few of the columns in this case. We'll look at time, tackles, and position. So we can use the select function to get from a data set that has um, all of the columns to one with just a few. So again, we want to time, tackle, and position. All right, so time, tackles, and position. All right, and we're going to start by looking at the association between time and tackles, but then later we'll bring in position as well. So we'll go ahead and grab it for right now. We can overwrite World Cup with this so that we can then just use that smaller data set. So as I mentioned, we might want to start by looking at the relationship between time and tackles. So we can start just by visualizing that to get an idea of what we expect. And we can look, oh, actually, I had just gotten the first few columns there because I still had that head. If we do this now, we should have everything, just those three columns. All right, so if we do ggplot, we're going to do the World Cup data. And then let's look at time versus tackles. And we'll use a scatter plot, so that uses that point geom. And we can look, and there definitely seems to be this relationship. As we increase the time that a player played in the World Cup, there tend to be more tackles, although there is some variation around this. But there are some cases where we have people who played a really long time who have almost no tackles. And then maybe some cases on the upper edge where people had quite a lot of tackles given the amount of time they played. We might want to explicitly test this using some kind of a model or test. And so one natural way when we have these kinds of relationships where there might be kind of a linear or a monotonic change as we move for one variable on the other variable, we can use a regression model. And we'll start with a linear regression model. Again, we're trying to check to see if there's evidence that the expected or the mean number of tackles tends to increase or decrease or in any way change from the average value as the player's time increases. In a little bit, we'll talk about why a linear model might not be the best way to model this. Uh, but for right now, we're going to start with doing that. And we'll look a little bit once we fit this and talk about how to interpret things. We'll look at some of the diagnostics and see where we can see evidence of where maybe something else would have worked better. And then when we talk more broadly about generalized linear models, we'll talk about another model that might be more appropriate. 
Regression models can be used to estimate how the expected value of a dependent variable changes as an independent variable, one or more independent variables change. So in this case, we're interested in how this dependent variable of tackles, how that tends to change as we change an independent variable of time. In R, when we express this and we ask R to fit that model, we're going to use a regression formula. And for that, we'll say first, what we're looking at is the response variable or the dependent variable. So in this case, that's tackles. And then we'll do this tilde sign. And then we'll say on the right-hand side of that, we'll give it one or more independent variables for which we want to see that relationship of how this dependent variable tends to change as the independent variable changes. In this case, we only have one independent variable we want to look at, that's time but we'll see some cases later where we could add up and have more than one. You'll notice that this is using that tilde to separate our response variable or dependent variable from the independent variables that we're listing. This mimics the format that we often will use when we write these down uh, using mathematical equations or equations that, that might go in a paper for your model equation. So this is giving an output variable measured on the unit i as a function of these different input variables that we have, and then with some error in addition. So we'll use this type of structure in R for a lot of different function calls, including the ones that we have for linear models and generalized linear models. So we can fit this linear model in R using the ln function. If we come over and we say the data that we want to fit, so that's world cup. And then before that, in this call, we want to put that regression formula that we just talked about. So in this case, we want tackles as our dependent variable. And we want to see um, how that is explained by time. When we run this, we get out this printout. And, and you might notice it's a really similar idea to the printout that we get when we run some of the statistical hypothesis tests like we did in an earlier slide. So it gives us a nice way where we can look at some information like the estimates of the coefficient. So these are for the intercept and the slope if we're doing a, 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 um, if we're doing a simple linear regression where we only have one independent variable that we're fitting. So um, the, in this case, we're kind of estimating a regression line where the intercept with the y-axis is given by this intercept value. And then the slope, the change for every one unit increase, so every one minute increase in the intermittent variable of time, um, for each of those, how much we expect the number of tackles to change. So we have this information as a printout, but again, it's just printed out. It's not there where we can use it more. So let's try saving this to a specific object. And once we do that, we can take a look at what class that's in. So that's in this LM class, and it turns out that again, that is just gonna be a special type of list. So we can use some things like STR to explore it. And you can see it's got lots of different elements in there. It's got things like the coefficients and the residuals. So these coefficients are what we were just looking at with the estimate for the intercept and the estimate for the slope in association with that time variable. So these are things that operate at the level of coefficients, where for each of the coefficients that we kind of specified in our regression formula, it's, got, it's going to have some information, like the estimated value of it and maybe some values from a statistical test. It's got other information too. So it's got residuals. This is the difference between the fitted or estimated value that you get from the regression line that you fit and the actual observed value. So you have one of these for each of your original observations. We've also got some values that are really operating a little bit more at the level of, of the, the, um, the model as a whole. So we've got like this degrees of freedom for the residuals and we've got the call for the model as a whole. And we've got some other information as well that's really kind of operating at that model level. 
So if we want to use this, this might be a little bit hard for us to pull out the pieces that we want. But fortunately, the broom package has a lot of what we want to use to pull out specific parts of it. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Before we do, there are a few things that I wanted to point out. First of all, by default, an intercept is fit to the model. So in this expression, we didn't put in, we didn't need to put in anything where we said fit an intercept. Um, it automatically will fit that. You actually have to specify if you want to exclude one. Next, if you specify a data frame using the data in the LM call, like we did, so we use that data equals world cut, that allowed us to write the regression formula using columns in that data frame without having to do something like, um, like world cup dollar sign uh, time and world cup dollar sign tackles. So it lets us do that shorthand of just using the column names in the regression formula if we do data equals. Finally, as we just saw, you can save the output of that fit if model just like you can with other objects in R. So again, this is showing how we can check the class of that and see that it's an LM class, which is just a special type of list object. And we can do different things to explore that. We can use names to pull out the names of all the values or do str to explore the structure as we, as we did in the example in our studio. All right, so now let's look at how we can pull out tidy pieces from this data. So these really operate, there, there are three different functions we'll look at, and they operate based on three levels of types of data you might get from the model. So we talked about this just briefly before, but the first thing that we might get are kind of estimates or, or measurements that are at the level of the model. For those, we'll use the glance function. So let's take this LM results and use glance with it. So we can run that. That's giving us estimates that are model fit wide. So they're across the whole model fitting process that we just ran. Those include things like the R squared and adjusted R squared value. The next thing operates at the level of intercepts. A lot of times this might be the first thing that you wanted to pull and look at. So this will, will typically have more than just one row. The glance output for a single model will tend to have just one row for the tuple because it is model-wide. Instead, this tidy will have one row per, um, per variable plus one for the intercept. So in this case, we're only looking at one variable, the time variable. So it includes one row for time and then one row for the model intercept. The values that it gives here include the estimates for those. So these were the things that we looked at before. This is the estimate of the intercept, and this is the estimate for the slope with relation to time. It also gives us a standard error, a test statistic, and then a p-value that's testing against the null that that value is equal to zero. So in other words here, this you can see is very, very small. It's much, much smaller than, than a threshold you might use like 0.05. And this is testing whether or not this is zero. So if this value were zero, we would expect that our fitted line, instead of kind of moving up as we go across time, would move straight across. So it would be a horizontal line with a slope of zero. So this p-value is saying that it's very unlikely in this case that that is the case. So this tidy is pulling, again, the data from the model fit that's at the level of these different, um, these different um, variables that we included in the model, the independent variables plus the, the intercept. The last thing that we can do when we're looking at this is use augment. So this pulls back the information that was at the level of observation. So we talked about there were residuals and you would have one of those for each observation. Also, it doesn't just pull that back, but it actually kind of tacks it on to our original data set. So it allows us to work a little bit more with our original data set. So we can look at that here. So we've got some values that we already had in our data. We've got the row names and the tackles in time. These are all things that went in and were used to fit the model. 
But we also have these values over here that are the result of fitting the model, but where we have one per original observation. So those include things like the estimate of the fitted value. This is the value that we estimate based on taking the model that we fit and running it with the, with the, um, the time variable and the actual observation. We've also got the residual. This is going to be like if we had a line here for a regression line, this is going to be the difference between what was observed and the estimated value that we're fitting along the line. These results can be really useful for doing some plotting. So for example, we could take these results and send them into ggplot. We can do time on the x-axis. And then we can do still our points, just like we're doing now, that show tackles. But then we could do a line, and maybe we'll do it in a different color. And for this one, let's do, I'm sorry, this should be AAS, this is an aesthetic mapping. Okay, so let's come here, and for this one, let's actually put in the fitted values. Sure, I spell that correctly. All right, so now what we have is we have those original points still, but we also have a line that shows the fitted value at each point along the measured observations that we have for time. And so then our residuals are going to be how far each of those points are off of that line. This is showing how to do that one more time, and in this case, I've increased the size of it as well, so it really stands out. Another thing that can be very helpful are to look at diagnostic plots <clears throat> based on the, the model that you just fit. These can help you pinpoint if there are areas where you might have some problems in the fit of your model or problems in the, in the validity of the assumptions that you made when you fit that model. Autoplot is another one of these functions that's actually got different methods for different object classes. And you can apply it kind of generically to a lot of different object classes, and its behavior will depend on the class of the object you input to it. You do need to make sure that you have ggfortify installed. Although the generic autoplot function comes with ggplot, the methods specifically for LM and GLM objects, which we'll be using here, those come in the ggfortify package. We can run that by taking the name of our model output and running autoplot on it. So we can come here in the example I'm doing here, I actually call these LM results. So we can do that and we can pipe it into autoplot. So by default, it will give us these four different diagnostic plots. And again, you should learn more about these in your statistics classes in terms of what assumptions you can check with each of them and what you should, should be looking very closely for. But we can walk through just a few that are showing that perhaps in this case, a linear model was not the best model to fit. So one is here where we look at fitted values versus residual values. So each of these points are one of the original observations, one of the players. And we would hope that these residuals tend to have an average value of zero, uh, regardless of kind of like where we are going across the fitted values. And that looks pretty reasonable. It looks like we're okay there. But the other thing that we're looking for is for these residuals to be about evenly spread out as we go across this. So in other words, we're looking for kind of like a, a, a flat bar shape. Instead, we're seeing this kind of funnel shape here. This is something that we might often see where we have data like this that's count data and it's not normally distributed, but instead where we have um, maybe a lot of counts that are zero or near zero and we can't get that symmetrical nature of the normal distribution because we're running into zero and we can't go into negative values. This is a normal quantile quantile plot of the residuals, the standardized residuals. And in this case, again, we're kind of trying to check the normality of those. If they are 
uh, pretty close to normal, then we'd see them follow, falling right along this dotted line. And instead, we're seeing at the ends that they get pretty far off it. So again, these are all suggestions that we violated some of the assumptions that, that were kind of embedded in that linear test. And we might want to look at something else, uh, like, like something in the wider family of generalized linear models. And we'll do that in, in, um, in the next video lecture. So a note about autoplot, getting back more to the mechanics of R for this, it is something that is a ggplot object. And so if you want to, you can add some different elements. So you could like add a theme, like the black and white theme. So again, what we were seeing from those plots was some evidence that the linear regression model might not have been the best one. And so in that case, we might want to go back and explore the dependent variable that we put in the regression model. Uh, because one of the assumptions is that, that we think that, that the, the error term is normally distributed, and often that's going to translate to having that outcome variable pretty close to normally distributed as well. And if we look at that, we can see that we've got this case where we've got a lot of values down near zero, and then we've got some stuff going really far out to the right. Um, but we don't have that symmetric pattern that we normally see for normal distributions because things can't go below zero. So this is a pretty classic example of where we might want to consider something more appropriate to count data. And a natural first choice to check there is a Poisson model. And we'll look at that within the framework of generalized linear models um, in the next video lecture. So another thing that we can do is we can use binary variables, so categorical or factor variables, rather than continuous variables. We put those in in exactly the same way that we did before. So let's go back and look here. And before, we were fitting a model where we looked at the association with time. This time, instead, let's look at the association with position. So you can see I'm taking the name of that column, this column is position, and I'm putting it in as the same way as an independent variable on that right-hand side of the tilde. When we run this though, the output that we get is gonna be a little bit different. So if we just run the output itself, we'll see the nice printout. And you can see instead of just having one value in addition to the intercept, we actually get three. You'll get the number of categories that there are for that for that particular um, uh, variable factor, the number of levels, minus one. And what happens is that one of the levels will serve as a reference, and then these are giving values of the average difference between people in each of these positions and that reference position. So let's look so that we can look a little bit more closely. Let's do the tidy output from this. That gives us a nice data frame where again, we've got the intercept value, and then we move into each of these specific positions. So you can see that we've got forward, goalkeeper, and midfielder. I think the one that's missing is defender. So defender is serving as a reference for these other groups. And that's likely been the one selected because it was the first level of the factor, which is likely because it's the first alphabetically. So now how we interpret this, the estimate for position forward is the estimate of how different the mean number of tackles are for forwards as compared with defenders, as compared with that reference group. And the, the test statistic and the p-value in this case are making a comparison, or, or excuse me, they're, they're um, testing against the null hypothesis that the difference between the reference level, which is defender, and this level of position, which is forward, that that difference is zero, that they have the same number of average tackles. So we can go through and see that, and we can see from this that it looks like midfielders have very close to the same number, although a little bit less, of tackles compared to defenders, which are, again, the, the reference category. Forwards and goalkeepers both have quite a lot less of tackles on average compared to the defenders. So again, this, this slide is taking you through that interpretation that the intercept is the expected average value of the outcome 
for the first level of the factor in this case. So this is the expected value for defenders. And then each of these others are the expected difference from this. And you can go through and do the calculation too here if you want of what the average number of tackles were among forwards. It's going to be 5.46 minus 